Welcome to another episode of My Corner of the Universe. Today we have another return guest. I believe maybe our second return guest that we've had. This is Nate Shepard. For those of our old school OG listeners, you would remember him from way back in 2019. And we say that seemed like a world ago. It literally was right. a world ago in 2019, November, especially 2019, where um, Nate came on and talked about his project, his documentary film that he was doing in Haiti. And at that point, Nate, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was just the trailer and maybe a little bit more that you had going on. Um, but we're talking to him today because he has the full feature production done. Um, me and Rex have both watched it. It's awesome. It's incredible. Um, but first, we get into it. Nate, thank you for coming back and joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. So back then when you first started you know talking to us was it just the trailer you had in the works or where were where were things at when we first talked yeah i think so i think you'd actually stumbled on it from kickstarter if yeah. i remember correctly yeah. and so i was right in the middle of trying to raise money to finish production so at that point i actually had uh, filmed everything everything had already been filmed i'd been down to haiti a number of times ahead of that and just kind of out of pocket uh, funded it and then sort of you know the goal with the kickstarter was to backfill that um, and then you know put some money toward production and so at that point i think i'd maybe put together you know a rough draft of the first 10-ish minutes and then you know there was a trailer for it as well uh, and then as a result of the kickstarter I actually was able to raise twenty four thousand dollars to finish production wow that's nice. amazing how is that kickstarter experience you know now that you've completed it gone through it what what are some things that now that you look back you're like man i wish i would have done this differently or hey this worked really well for my kickstarter experience yeah um i would say the 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 main thing for me was for sure giving people opportunity to participate in a way that was not hard for me to keep organized um, so that's the benefit of kickstarter is like they they've already got a platform built they've got a reputation with that um, and then what i personally really loved about it was uh, that you had tiers or, or ways of in investing in the film where there was some type of return. Um, and again, you know, we'll probably get into this in a bit here, but the film itself is about treating people with dignity, uh, looking to long-term solutions of, of building communities and dealing with poverty and all of that. And it was really important to me in how I told the story and how I, you know, did this project that not just the film itself would be about treating people with dignity, but that the whole process would be as well. And so uh, it, it was really important to me to have some type of deliverable, even though I'm sure plenty of people would have been like, here, have some money. And to be honest, at this point, as I'm, you know, sending out emails and stuff, there's a number of people who are like, I forgot that I bought, backed this. And I yeah. remember, you know, it's like, it's so... <laughs> And granted, you know, as you said, you know, that was 2019 and that, that was, you know, a decade ago at this point. But um, but it, I think that was probably my favorite part about the Kickstarter was uh, to be able to, you know, promise people something that it's like you it's not just finances that you're investing here, but that you actually get a return mm -hmm. um, on your investment. I mean, it's not equivalent because it's sort of like, you know, I can't actually give you back necessarily everything that you've invested in this project but a way for you to actually own something or, or participate in something for yourself um and so yeah i i, I personally i i enjoyed the process i will say i probably over promised on a couple things um <laughs> so there's definitely some like okay maybe next time uh because what it, what it ended up being is so i shot the, the most of the film and i had my brother help shoot it as well um, and then I was going to edit the whole thing as well as uh, create music for it. So I, I composed wow. most of the music for it and then awesome. my dad helped with that as well. But then also as part of the deliverables was like a photo book and a DVD <laughs> and a poster. And so I'm having to suddenly be like, oh, I have to design all of this stuff and don't have the budget necessarily to hire outside. So I just basically did pretty much all the work myself. Um, which was fun. And, uh, you know, I will say one of the most special things for me about finishing the film, it's this weird thing where uh, it felt real when I first held the DVD in my hand, which is sort mm -hmm. of funny. You know, I'm clearly, you know, marking myself as a very sort of yeah. generation where movies are DVDs. They were VHS. Yeah. But but I was going to say, uh, the beta, yeah. the beta, the beta <laughs> when I held that Betamax tape in my hand. <laughs> yeah, and I, I do have this joke with my brother that I would love to be able to like, 
get it on VHS just yeah. because, you know, that's what real cool. movies were. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, DVD is a passe medium at this point anyway, but it, there was just something about holding it, you know, the shrink wrapped DVD that looked good. And I was like, this is my film. That was just, again, I think ties back to that, like tangibility of like, I, I, I have something that represents the film. And so, you know, I'm, I don't know if other people felt the same way, but I imagine if I were to invest in a film like mine, having the DVD would just be a special token, even if I never actually watch it on the DVD. But it's just that token of like, I helped create this, mm -hmm. this movie. Um, and so I don't know if that gets to you. Yeah, similar to like an author, I would imagine you, know, you finally get that book in your hand and you're like, <laughs> wow, this is like the culmination of all my work. And so yeah. I could totally see that. Yeah, yeah for sure yeah it's hard to encapsulate when things stay digital i feel like the completionist of it versus a, a physical tangible thing sometimes yeah and the other tangible piece of it too was being able to show it so i actually got to show it in our local theater um, awesome. Oh, awesome yeah um, basically just a one night showing and then uh so that was here in rhinelander and then uh, at the end of january i'm hoping to to show it at a theater in minneapolis as well um and that definitely was it, that that's a whole nother saga that's probably not worth getting into because mm -hmm. it's really technical of just all this pain and suffering that i had to go through <laughs> to get it to actually be on the big screen it was both simpler than you would think and much more difficult and you know it was just a mess so i remember that night that i showed it i was very like just relieved that i was finally able to get there um so i don't know if i was as like present to be able to take in the, the full experience but there was something really special about sitting in a theater well just after the past couple of years being able to sit in a theater at all um, but with 70 other people who are all invested many of whom had actually supported the project um, and being able to share it with them in this sort of you know epic scale and you know i worked hard to make sure that all the sounds sounded good as possible in the surround sound there and all that and um, so I'm, I'm hoping to that this this sort of next theater showing will be kind of that f final capstone of saying, all right, this project is done. Everything that I have to do for it is done. And I get to share it in sort of the best possible capacity, yeah. uh, which will be really exciting. That's awesome. I, I have a follow up question for that. But I, first, I kind of want to circle back and just like, why don't we just fill people in on the premise of the film you can do maybe do even do a little bit of background on yourself for people that might not have caught the first episode and just can kind of just have a foundation for the rest of the conversation yeah so uh my name is nate shepherd and i'm a filmmaker based in rhinelander wisconsin uh we've been living up here for about six years i'm originally from the minneapolis area um but you know i've had a lot of different things that have led me to this particular moment i don't know that we need to go into detail on that but um, just found myself moving more and more toward media production as a career and then as an artist and finding that um that i love it i mean I, i've really been enjoying it. it's it's obviously hard work but um and so one of the very first things that i got into when i started to do media production was i um, I was working at a church at the time. I was a youth and music pastor um, and got uh, connected with an organization in rural Northwest Haiti called Lemuel Ministries and uh, was almost immediately just blown away by their approach, their mentality. Uh, that's, you know, the, the film ultimately goes in depth into who they are and why I, you know, found them to be so compelling. But they're very focused on treating their local community with dignity, uh, looking to long-term sustainable solutions to poverty alleviation. Um, you know, one aspect is that they, you know, they do a lot of reforestation, they do uh, employment, they have a school, they just a ton of different layers to what they're doing there uh, in Haiti. And part of what I just really loved about them is like they're they're not there to make money you know that's again a big part of the film is just how important it is to the founder to not uh i, I feel like i'm talking in sort of a circle because it's like you know again no you're good yeah this, this conversation so yeah. i guess you know listen to the other i probably said it a lot more eloquently on the previous podcast but um but yeah lemuel was founded by a haitian man named mani stilus and he he was from that not not only is he haitian but he's from that local community that he's serving right now and so the film actually explores not only how lemuel ministries approaches what they do and just the different layers to that but it also follows the story of manis and how he 
grew up in poverty, moved away to the city, got educated because of some generous support uh, of some missionaries, and then was able to come back to that community and start to develop um, really everything from scratch. I mean, that community uh, had nothing by way of, you know, they didn't have water, they didn't have trees, they didn't have much by way of making money. Um, and so he, he was able to, to pour into that community and over a long period of time, ultimately was able to build up an organization that, uh, you know, depending on the year, might have 40 to 60 Haitians that are employed, um, many of whom are from that area, grew up in that area. And so he's giving them, uh, you know, the opportunity to, to, to invest in their future and actually create that future for themselves. And now part of what's fun about stepping into the story at this juncture is that it's already on the second or third generation. So the yeah. first generation that he poured into his kids, and then you get to spend a little bit of time of those kids growing up and then pouring into the next generation. And, you know, it's just really cool to be able to see not only the, the principle, but the actual practice of it and be able to see, okay, this actually is kind of working and it's not easy. It's very hard to invest in people, to focus on long-term solutions to not just, you know, give into the temptation to use shock and awe to raise money. So that's another big component to it is that, uh, you know, he will never use his community and the, the poverty that they're experiencing mm -hmm. to drive money, to drive pity so that he can, you know, raise funds for that. And again, that was a big part of why I wanted, you know, how I wanted to tell the story is I wanted to tell their story in a dignified way. And so it was important to me to not showcase them in a way that was unflattering or unhelpful um, either and realizing hey they actually do have nice clothes you know that they wear they it might only have one pair but it's like the, there's a lot of pride in their community yeah that um, part stuck out to me too i, I love that part when manis was talking about that where he's just like i'm, I'm not going to use i will never use poverty to sell and, he, and you know what he i'm sure he knows he's a smart guy he knows he could get more donations by using poverty, oh, yeah. you know, by showing pictures of, because, you know, you're pulling on the heartstrings of wealthy Westerners or, you know, Americans. And it's just, Oh man, these poor kids, they don't have shoes, this and that. But he's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that to my people to, to play this game of showing poverty. And I didn't even think about it watching the video until you just mentioned it now. But I was like, yeah, now that you mentioned that Nate, like the whole video, like I didn't, there wasn't any ports in that video where you're showing, you know, really impoverished people where it's like, oh man, things are so bad there. Um, it really is so much more of a positive story and uplifting yeah, story really of seeing like, and we all, we all know Haiti in the news. 90% of what we hear in Haiti in the news is hurricanes, earthquakes, you know, massive crime in Port-au-Prince and the big cities. Um, but you watch your documentary and there's such uh, a feeling of joy and, and happiness there, you know, um, and gratitude also yeah that was a, an interesting balance to strike too because you know i've had this conversation with the staff at lemuel that it it also doesn't help to just pretend like that's all it is you know like there is this reality this abject reality of suffering and difficulty that needs to be addressed that needs to be acknowledged and yet it's like you can do a disservice to a, a marginalized people group in two different ways you can romanticize and say oh you know all they have is family and yet they're so happy and so then it, you you sort of blind yourself to the realities mm -hmm. of like no there there's some very miserable realities that they face every day um but at the same time there's so much more than what the, than the suffering there's so much more you know humans are 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 more than than what we go through and so trying to find that balance of like yes things are difficult yes there's frustration yes there's setbacks and yet there's also this beautiful vibrant flourishing community that's still struggling you know it's like the flourish struggle balance is this constant tension and to your point too i think you know i feel like i could lean more heavily on the positive side because it's like if you want the negative side of what's happening in haiti or some of the challenges that they're facing We've got plenty of mm -hmm. media yeah, centered totally. around that. And so just trying to reframe what that might look like um, while being faithful to their story and saying, yeah, there are genuine struggles here. But ultimately, the tone is, is very much focused on saying, you know, inspiring what what can we do and how can we move forward? Um, and I know when my mom watched it, she had 
cut when I think she watched a really early cut of it and and observed that she just saw this sort of like the she particularly liked the sequence toward the end where you see like kids dancing and goats jumping and there's sort of this just like fun upbeat vibe to it and sort of she she walked away feeling like hopeful Mm -hmm. um and if i remember correctly this was probably march april let's see when no it would have been the following spring so this is 20 i'm trying to remember the timeline now so i think the spring of I don't know. It was, the win- it was the winter during the pandemic. So we're, mm. we're kind of full in the pandemic. And I think we're already just feeling the weight of mm. everything going wrong. What's We have no hope for the future. I mean, that, that's a lot of what I've observed that I think, um, I think maybe just sort of the, the timing of this film and the project has been very fortuitous in the sense of putting forth a hopeful vision for the future in a context that is objectively difficult and challenging to have that hope. And my desire would be if there is something, you know, that people can experience with this film is just saying, hey, guess what? We're all kind of experiencing some level of like difficulty and trauma, no matter who you are, no matter where you are. It's like a global pandemic is pretty remarkable. And Obviously, we can compare sufferings and, you know, that doesn't tend to be very useful. But at the end of the day, we're all humans trying to Mm -hmm. struggle through this. And so my hope would be to showcase sort of this, you know, if 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 this community can find their way toward hope and a meaningful, grounded hope, not just a, a, a wishful thinking kind of hope. How can this then inspire you to see your community the same way? That right now, it doesn't seem like there's a way. Right now, it seems like every door is closed. Every light has been turned off. And yet, there will always be that one little way that you can go, that one step forward you can take. And so, and that was another aspect of treating people with dignity that was important is that there's no call to action. Mm -hmm. Um, I had another friend sort of comment like, there wasn't really like we weren't sure what the takeaway was and i was like then that means i did my job like it's a bit of an unusual approach to a documentary from what i understand of you know a lot of films especially films dealing in similar you know issues of justice and equity and things like that that there's very much like this call to action or this sort of heavy-handed here's what you should think here's what you should do and it was important to me to not approach it that way um partially because ultimately I didn't want it to be like a glorified commercial for the organization. They didn't want it to be that way. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted it to be a, you know, certainly it will, I I hope benefit the organization in saying, Hey, do you want to learn more about them? And and if you want to support them, that would be absolutely wonderful and is definitely a desire. But at the same time, I don't want you walking away feeling this sense of, okay, now I need to give money to this organization or now I need to care about Haiti in this way. I'm like, actually, if you walk away, and don't give Haiti another thought if you're not Haitian, then great. Give a thought to your community. Give a thought mm-hmm. to other communities mm-hmm. that you're already good, connected yeah. to. Like the, the takeaway isn't help Haiti this, you know, do this for Lemuel, do this for these people. It's like, no, take this heart of seeing hope where it feels hopeless and, and, and looking to the long term and asking yourself, how do we help people while also treating them with dignity and not just mm-hmm. using them for our own personal gain? Guess what? Every community is going to have some dynamic like that. Every yeah. community has vulnerable people. Every community has mm-hmm. struggles and challenges. And every community has people. Yeah, period. It's, it's easy to put people in buckets and categories too, you know, like Oh man, Haiti is just so poor and it's so crazy there, you know? Oh man, Chicago is like insane with crime. Um, and what I love about documentaries and films like this is it puts real life reality to it. And then it starts to kind of take us to step back and be like, I shouldn't just say like Haiti's like full of crime. Like there's like, there's all different aspects of it. You shouldn't say that this area is just this. And it helps us pull back some of these generalizations and stereotypes, good or bad that we have of there are certain areas realize like there's independent stories all around that are completely different than what the narrative of what you think is. Yeah. I also feel like you really encapsulated, uh, Menace's vision Mm -hmm. of, um, you know, I could give you a fish or I could teach you the fish. And I feel like, you know, starting off and kind of showing his journey and how he kind of started his roots 
and how he moved and said, you know, this is what we're going to do here. Even though these trees are going to die, we're going to keep planting them. Mm -hmm. And then this kind of see how that has changed that plateau. I thought it was great. It was just, it really kind of, uh, fully engulfed what he was trying to to do in his mind and, and, and to see it come into reality. Yeah. I'd even say not even his vision, but his leadership. Yeah. Um, that was one of the biggest takeaways for me. Cause like you said, you know, a lot of us have heard the analogy of like, Oh, you give a man a fish, you know, eats for a day, you teach him to fish eats for his life. But what was impactful for me was after maybe it was hurricane Matthew, I think one of the big hurricanes that came through there and it wasn't him going around telling all the people like, Hey, I'm not just going to give you these rations. Let's do this. It was like, no, the, the people in the, the village, people, like, yeah. they were the ones saying we need yeah. to build our gardens. And that's the, the powerful leadership that he implanted. There was like to have that come from everyone that they're saying like, no, don't just give me handout. Like we need to rebuild our gardens because this is how we, we become self-sufficient and produce for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, there's a whole, that, that's part of what I love about the film is that, you know, obviously it touches on so many different aspects of just life and and more specifically you know poverty alleviation but um i think i lost my train of thought well it, it just powered like you there's a part kind of a little bit more towards the end when Manise is he gets a little fired up he's talking about working hard um with the, with like just everyone around him and how they're all working hard now he would just like he was like oh, i'm not working as hard as i used to but you could just really feel that part i don't know for whatever for me i felt his passion really coming through so well there on film yeah. he was just talking like so intently on like you know how much he has put into this but not in a way of like hey look at me what i put into this but just like you could see that he's put so much into this because he cares so much about you know about all these people yeah yeah i do i had a couple questions regarding um you know when you when you're putting this together you said you'd filmed it um in early 2019 is that when you grabbed the phone? Uh, it was three years. So 2017 was a good portion. I, I filmed okay, it, got it. And I filmed a little bit in 18 and then most of it in 19. Uh, when you're putting it together, was there any points where you're like, oh gosh, I wish I could go back down there and get this? Or was, was that you just <laughs> kind of had to work with what you had basically? Yeah, there's a lot. So the challenge of it too is, like I said, it was one of the first projects that I dove into. And, you know, I... I knew some of what I'm doing. I wouldn't have taken on a documentary if I didn't at least know how to turn on a camera. But <laughs> the amount of knowledge that I have now with regards to cinematography and sound design and all of that stuff as oh, a result I'm sure. of making yeah. the documentary, it is very much this position now of like, the next film is going to be better because I can't think about this one anymore. Like I can't fixate on all of the things I wish I would have done. But there's so much that I wish I would have known and would have done more uh, effectively and and it just ultimately it's it's saving you so much extra time so I do feel like I might have been able to shave off even half a year of production oh wow um, and now that's a bit misleading because that just it, it, the reality is is I have a life outside of production mm -hmm. and totally. so it's all that other stuff that's interrupting constantly but it's like you know if I were to condense it down into you know maybe it would end up being just a, a month or two of concerted work but it's like there's there's just so much that i was trying to i mean that's part of the the beauty of art and creativity is is it's actually uh constraint can be one of your best friends because it forces you to really say what you mean and focus where you need to focus and so there was a fair amount of that where i was like sometimes it was nice where i was like well i can't really use that footage so i guess i won't you know like it right. windows it down but there were a lot of of gaps and little moments and things and even just phrases i mean i'm sure you guys can appreciate this as podcast editors that sometimes you're like oh no i this is a great sound bite but we got into it sort of halfway to where it doesn't make sense out of context mm -hmm. and so when you're moving pieces around suddenly you have to supply and so there's a little bit of that kind of finessing how they're saying things just so it makes sense mm -hmm. never changing what they actually are saying but just changing maybe the wording slightly mm -hmm. so that it flows better and you know countless other examples like that of just issues with sound design issues with images and the you know exposure blah 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 all this technical stuff that i wish i would have known before so i could have shot it more you know effectively at the at the start yeah. but it is you know at some point it is what it is and i'm proud of what i was able to 
create from the pieces and there are definitely some like wow boy did i work hard to get that to make sense or to, yeah. to flow properly. <laughs> all this invisible you know it's that it's that classic like <clears throat> i know i did my job when people feel like it was effortless and yeah. it's this unfortunate reality of being a creative is that uh, people just don't, don't have any concept, even if they think they do, or even if they're sort of like, oh, that's hard. You still don't really have a concept of what all goes into making something like this. And if you do your job well, people walk away saying, you know, feeling like it was effortless. They, they walk away with the story being impacted by the experience and they don't think at all about the technical stuff, which is the goal. But then you sort of feel like, but <laughs> but that was I put so much into that. Yeah. Like, can somebody? And so every once in a while, I'll have like a friend in the business who's like, "I see you. I see that. And yeah. I'm like, Thank you. I appreciate that." Yeah. <laughs> did awesome. you did you storyboard a lot of it, um, or did you kind of have a rougher outline? And if you did kind of storyboard it, how well did it end up sticking to your original plan? Um, it was a bit of a combo because I'm still learning how I work. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very much a fly by the seat of my pants, generally speaking. I'm learning now the value of, of pre-production, but um, I would say it was a bit of a hybrid. I mean, there's a natural progression. So Manisa's story, it's like you start at the beginning and then you mm -hmm. move up to present day. Um, and then obviously the sort of runs in tandem with the story of Lemuel. But then I also had this other storyline where when I was there in 2019, um, actually a significant portion of the film was all just one morning where mm -hmm. I followed the founder around for a morning and just had him mic'd up and he was talking to another staff member, which ended up being a great way to tell the story because then they could have this natural conversation and that we get to sort of listen in on. Um, and so that in and of itself was sort of like, you get up in the morning, you get in the truck, you go around to this site, to that site, and there was some re ordering of what order we actually technically went to the different sites and then I knew that right around the 60 minute mark is where I wanted them to, to finally end up in his house mm -hmm. and so there's this scene where all you see like there's not any extra quote-unquote dialogue it's a documentary so I don't know if you call it dialogue but there's not any like specific concrete thing being discussed it's just watching Manise with his wife and kid them spending time playing music together, dancing, you know, and that's a, you know, five ish minute sequence. And so I knew that I wanted that where it was supposed to be. And so then you just start to build all these other pieces around it. And I did do various forms of like, uh, not storyboarding per se, but scripting. Like I, I transcribed the whole thing, like all of my interviews and started to just take chunks and sort of on paper, move pieces of paper around to see, you know, what things fit together. And uh, mm. to be honest, I'd have to go back and look. I have no idea if that was useful or not. It's just, some of it is just baking <laughs> Some of the process, in. yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's just like sitting with the material and saying what's going to make sense, what isn't, uh, and just finessing. And, and that's a lot of how I work is, you you know, at some point you just dump it all in the timeline and you cut, 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 and you push and you push and you push. And then finally, at some point, something starts to make sense and you might get a scene done and you might... And it's just, I mean, at this point, maybe my brain is just trying to shut out the <laughs> the trauma the process. of all that process. Yeah. <laughs> at some point, I'll probably come back to it and just like reflect more on it. But it was, uh, I think the version you saw is technically titled Draft 10. Um, mm -hmm. And that's misleading. It's probably Draft 20, but it's like of a serious like Compressed. restructuring of yeah. the story. Mm -hmm. You know, it was roughly the 10th draft of like, uh, you know, substantively different from a previous draft. And so, you know, imagine trying to make a movie essentially 10 different times uh, is a little bit of how it felt. Um, I so, bet. Yeah, I mean, that's, we can talk about the specifics, is, but yeah. Yeah, it's, ton of work. Um, random question, in the middle of the film at some point, there was uh, a section where Manis gathered, I think he said roughly 70 people together and they just dig a big hole. Is that more or less a well that they were digging? It turned so that, into a, like a pond or, you know, a small lake. Yeah. So that, those are, that's a water hole. Um, okay. And is, William So is actually William So who's talking about it. He's one of the staff members that Manis trained. Um, but yeah, water, water holes are a very big initiative um, that mostly get touched on in the last uh, third of the film. Um, but basically, I mean, I think William so explains that um, 
because they don't get water in their local community, it's all coming down from the rain. Right. Yeah. He described that. So yeah. That's what the canals are for. Okay. So that's more of a catchment. Catches all that okay. water. Um, I wasn't and, sure if they were actually trying to dig for water because I know. No. And he's mentioned that they tried to dig a well and they didn't get anything at some point. Yeah, they've they've tried digging wells a, a number of times. Um, and actually, one of the years I was there, I think 2017, they did a really big. Like that, as we were leaving the the well digging truck, it's like a special kind of truck, right? Yeah, uh, pulled into campus, and so that whole next week, they were they had a couple of uh, sites that they'd done a, a hydrogeological survey to identify the possibility of there being some decent water, and every single one of those uh, ended up being a dud, and so it's just like there's just no clean water there, um, and even the water that comes down from the mountains, it's yeah, it's mostly to water plants and and animals and maybe to to wash things a little bit, but it's it's not at all clean and healthy. And uh, you know, I think the people probably still drink it, but um, oddly enough, it, this is a whole section that isn't in the uh, didn't ended up on the cutting room floor just because it slowed it down. But um, Chriselle talks a little bit about how even that water, oddly enough, because of how poor it is, it can cause dehydration which is counterintuitive, but it's got all this extra stuff in it that I think actually can uh, sort of be counterintuitive and causes like hypertension and all this like blood pressure stuff. And so it's just, it's not good water to, for, for the people to drink, um, but is obviously essential for, you know, planting trees and general um, daily life. And so it, it, it is very important. And then they truck water from another community, a couple hours away so it's it's not fun <laughs> but yeah and i think i'm glad you touched on that too because i think that is kind of the reality like you mentioned of um not trying to paint the picture too much of everything's just so happy and great there and they're like you know which it, it is they're you know they seem like joyful people but like you just mentioned i think the water issue is just one of those obviously huge examples of the reality of poverty yeah, I mean, that's like the most essential thing in life is to find water. And they're on this plateau that you you kind of touched on it. But basically, all the trees there were harvested at one point just for firewood or? I'm not entirely sure. Um, a fair amount currently, if a tree gets cut down, it's probably being burned for charcoal. Um, so I don't entirely know what all the dynamics are. That's, a, that's beyond my pay grade. It is very, mm -hmm. very complicated. Um, but yeah, Haiti used to be tropical, um, right. and you can mm -hmm. see if you look at a map, like a satellite image of Haiti, and then it shares the island with Dominican Republic, and it's, yeah. like, it's literally night and day. And it again, it does touch on this in the film too, of like just the this is something that maybe we who live in areas, and I don't know what maybe some of California probably has experienced similar dynamics with drought and things like that. Um, certainly where I grew up, I grew up in the Midwest. I still live in the Midwest. We are not at a lack, uh, for water and trees. I mean, it's like literally, right. Opposite of where you know, we're at, yeah. I have friends who live, you know, only a couple miles away, but it takes a half hour to get there because you're going around all these lakes and whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a cycle. It's an ecosystem within that, you know, where if you take away the trees, it, yeah, it, it exactly. lowers the quality of the soil. And then that whole thing, it's like the soil doesn't retain water. The trees actually, I guess, pull water. It does explain that in the film. But I didn't know that, that if you have trees that they provide a certain level of moisture that increases the likelihood of rain because it's rain, like yeah. like pull, yeah. it's like attracting clouds. And so it's just this vicious, and then that all erodes into the ocean. And then it's just, you know, yeah. the soil's not good. The trees won't stay. The rain won't, you know. So that's why they're so aggressive on water catchment holes and reforestation and all that is because eventually it, hopefully we'll turn a corner and eventually start to you had some some drone footage itself. in there and some of it uh was it like previous drone footage that you'd captured from s somewhere else or someone else or was that because it looked like the, almost like some before and after footage yeah so uh, most of the drone footage was mine like i filmed it myself um but then uh i actually left a drone with them uh, when I was there one year. And so they've been able to use that to capture uh, oh, neat. some images. Nice. And so I actually asked Judy, um, Manisa's wife, to to get that last shot. So, it, you know, at the very end of the film, 
there's a, a picture, an archival picture from, I think, 2008, maybe. Okay. Um, and that was taken from an airplane. Got it. Um, of the of their community and the sort of the campus there, and then I had her go out and just get me that same same angle, angle yeah. Um, and that that was another really like it's if you actually break down what you're seeing on screen there, there's some visual effects and some things that I had to do to make that match. So the mm -hmm. the archival photo is really distorted from the original to get it to sort of line right. up with uh, with the drone footage. But then that way you can see, you know, however many years that let's see, 2008 to 2021. Um, 13 years yeah. 13 not years not that many difference. years to see such a huge difference yeah yeah i mean the camp like like she says at the beginning of the film chrishell says you know the campus is completely different it's, it's yeah got and it's actually very a very pleasant like i've again i've been there a few times and i'd vacation there like it's it's a gorgeous campus they're very hospitable i mean that's something they pride themselves on they keep the campus very clean um and just such a i mean you you might not want to be there during the the hot season but other than that it's like just an incredibly pleasant uh area to be with on the you know on the local campus there um and i think as you know i don't remember if it gets into this in the film as much but um i think part of the idea with their sort of local campus is you know part of the challenge that they had had to overcome in the early days of working in that community is convincing the local people of this long term and he touches on that a little bit that of like, vision yeah you know the the trying to convince people not to cut down trees but then they have to cut down trees because then they can create charcoal and provide for their families and so it's like it's not that it's not that these people are obstinate necessarily it's like no they this is survival this is day-to-day -day survival mm -hmm. so you're asking them to give up even more than than what they've already had to give up for this long-term vision and then I think once the campus started to like clearly be different and be like, oh, now we can actually see, we have a tangible example of why this is important. And so I think over time, not only their local community, but a bunch of surrounding communities have started to change their mentalities. And actually that's part of the, the story about, the, about Hurricane Matthew. You know, so Hurricane Matthew comes through, it, it wipes out a ton of, you know, livestock and and whatever infrastructure they have um, this was in 2016 and so you know the film talks about how manise sits down with the community and says you know what are we going to do how are we going to respond you guys need food what do you need and the community is actually the one that comes and says we don't don't give us stuff now give us like help us rebuild our gardens help us rebuild our canals so that we can get water and we can plant things um, a fair number, if I'm remembering correctly, a good number of people who were in that meeting were actually from other communities. Right. So they weren't the local community only, but uh, surrounding communities that came for his leadership over time yeah. wow. have like learned to to listen to what he's doing and be like, mm, I think there might be something to it. And I think that's some of what you know that just to have that amount of tenacity. Like I, I feel that right now, even of just you know, I'm raising little kids. I'm in communities that are very much, you know, sometimes I feel like polar opposite from each other. Uh, we've obviously experienced this in America where there's just a lot of, it, it's hard not to look at it and say that it's almost like a social, uh, a social poverty, an inability for us to communicate in healthy ways, to reach across barriers and dividers and recognize you know the humanity in each other and so feeling that tension of like you know i see this vision i have this core belief system that you know obviously enables me to tell the story of of lemuel in the way that i did was because i i value all of these things for myself and for my own communities and just looking out at the sort of you know for lack of a better word deterioration of the communities that um that i'm surrounded by and saying okay how how do you cast a vision when people don't see it's like i could never talk to somebody you know i could never talk to my republican family member or my democrat friend or the whatever it you know that's obviously the the surface level ones but there's tons of these dividers that it's like you can't even envision right what mm -hmm. that might look like and then you know i've had a few opportunities in my life to set an example and it's very difficult very difficult to do nobody believes you nobody trusts you and then if you're able to do that well then you start to see that shift mm. in that person where you're like 
oh, it actually is possible to do this differently. Like you just, you get into a mode. And so I think that's what's really encouraging about seeing this too, is Manisa's just tenacity and perseverance to not only do it himself, like that's that alone is enough perseverance, but to do so in a way that is trying to set that example for his community. And then watching as that very slowly and agonizingly, but eventually they catch that vision, they start to see, and now they are the ones casting the vision and they are the ones investing. And, in, you know, they, like, like you said, like they ask for about 40 people to show up one day to do work on this waterhole. About 70 people show up and, and William so says they want to work. Yeah. And what he's trying to articulate there is like, they're not looking for payment. They're not there to, to, to make a, a buck or whatever. They, they see that these water holes are for them and for the benefit of their community. So they're basically just saying, what do you need? Let's do it. We're excited. We'll make this happen no matter what. And then what I love about the organization is they're like, but they still will pay. They'll still provide food. They're still, you know, they're trying everything they can is, you know, we want to pay you for your work, but we also want the work to be for mm -hmm. you and for your benefit. And so always thinking in those ways. And, and that's not an easy approach at all, yeah. but it is possible. And that's what I love about that story is it is possible. And so, you know, on those days when I'm feeling really glum about mm -hmm. how little progress I'm making in relationships or in, you know, my local town and these, this area or that area, you can just be like, no, but it, it is perseverance and it is pushing through and you do have to set that example. Um, and eventually people start to, to see that. Um, yeah. what's the, uh, distribution plan for the, the film getting out, you know, have you thought about, is it possible? I mean, I have no idea of this space, but like in like film festivals, yeah, uh, like you, film you talked festivals about like, sure. you know, screening at, you're talking about one in, uh, in Minnesota. So like, what's kind of the goal? How can we help out? How can anybody listening help out to either get notoriety or just help get it to get the, get it, get it out to more eyeballs? That, that is the, 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 probably the hardest challenge for me is, I mean, a little bit of it is so much of my effort was put into making it that I'm like, okay, now what? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of me that's like, I don't know, it'll do what it does and I'm going to move on with my life. Um, I will say, um, I'm, so this is, a, this could be a whole podcast in and of itself, but uh, something that I'm really fascinated or interested in as an artist and just as a person, uh, you know, I'm a, a leader in my church. And so obviously I, as somebody influencing you know, in religious spaces as well, it's just thinking through what is community? What does it mean to be human? And especially as we're not really coming out of it, people often say, you know, now that the pandemic is over, it's like, <laughs> well, it's not over. It's just they stopped locking us in our houses. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Um, Hopefully. But a as as we were sort of, you know, forced into this online space. And certainly there are some tremendous benefits to that. Obviously, our ability to have this conversation is due to the internet. And so right. I'm mm -hmm. deeply grateful for that. However, as we've been discussing, it also has created some, and exacerbated, I don't know if it's created, but it definitely exacerbates uh, a lot of existing rifts. And ultimately, I think what it what it's doing is, is just highlighting how we have failed to build solid healthy communities and relationships mm -hmm. or, or that's been slowly being taken away from us and the internet is not the problem but it's certainly not the solution um and so i've just been thinking a lot as we come out of some of this stuff and are really re-evaluating you know churches were being obviously forced to meet online mm -hmm. and our church community i've been really grateful to be a part of during this season because the leadership is very much asking these questions of if you know, like if we don't meet in the building, are we still a church? Like, yeah. are we still a community? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if not, what are we doing? Like, yeah, why, what sure. is Sunday morning for? And so just really asking those hard hitting questions of like, what is it that we're actually doing when we come together? Are we actually connecting with each other? Are we actually investing and developing meaningful, lasting relationships? Or That's are we great. just showing up to a social club? And so, and I've watched that, you know, I'm, I'm deeply involved with our local arts community as well. And I've seen a lot of those same you know, dynamics play out of just like, you know, we come together maybe for a cause and that's good. And we, you know, we like each other, but are, are these genuine relationships and how do you build long-term sustainable relationships and community development, even within these contexts? And I think it's a question that we now all get to ask 
which is ultimately, I think, a good thing, but it's a very hard thing. And so all that is a long preamble to say, as I think about distribution, I do know from what I've researched that festivals, for the most part, are a bit of a racket. Mm. Um, you, you have to pay to submit to a number of them. And usually what that means is you're paying for them to watch it for the jury or whatever to watch it you're not mm -hmm. you're not guaranteed that it's going to be shown to anyone else um and certainly that you know, nothing beyond the festival itself or whatever so i'm open to those and i think i would probably look for like a specific niche festival where it's like yeah we actually are mostly focused on documentaries about poverty alleviation i'm like okay mm -hmm. then that probably fits um but personally i I would love this film to be very, uh, to be underground in like a, a good and intentional way. Um, and what I mean by that is having conversations like this or just a couple weeks ago, I actually had the privilege of um, hopping on a Zoom call with a, a class, a college class in Toronto mm. um, because the teacher of the class, had, they were talking about um, things related to the topic of the documentary and somehow his brother knew about Lemuel and knew about the documentary. And so he invited me to come and, you know, I just chatted with those students about, you know, and it was just, it's such an enriching opportunity. There were only three or four total of us in the call, but it was just a really rich and enjoyable conversation. And over time, like, as I show this film to people, I personally don't like watching it anymore because I've seen it so many times and all mm -hmm. I see are the flaws. But I love watching it with people and having conversations. And even when I showed it at the theater, just having a really meaningful conversation with a friend of mine. Um, we don't share the same belief system um, at all, but he was so impacted by the way that um, that sort of the Christian faith was represented in the film. And I think there was sort of this like uh, wistfulness for him of like, if only this is what the Christian faith was, you know, mm -hmm. if, if this is if this was the approach. And so just being really encouraged by that of like those kind of connections and those opportunities to have conversations and deepen relationships with people and ask deeper and better questions, the film is always going to function best on those levels. And so, you know, there's already been a number of churches and organizations and, you know, there's a lot of conversations that I'm having. Like I said, uh, I don't know when this episode comes out, but if you're in the Minneapolis area, before I, when does this episode come out i might not uh, it probably will be out by next week okay so i will say this for the sake of this episode <laughs> january 22nd 10 a.m in minneapolis there will be a showing at a large theater um and so if you're interested in uh, attending that and happen to be in the area uh that will be uh you can go to haitidocumentary.com and i'll put any any type of showings that i'm put on the calendar perfect yeah that's Send a great yeah. to go also i wanted wondering like let's say you know somebody i don't know if you're open to this like let, let's say somebody in any town you know they watch the film they really like it and they're like hey i want to have this shown in my local theater is there a way they can reach out to you and make that happen someone in san antonio or, or wherever yes. is that a possibility um, yeah i'm open to it it's it's complicated, okay, it's complicated. Um, so it would require somebody who is uh, a little tech savvy gotcha um, video okay. audio okay. Okay. yeah gotcha okay um cool. but certainly i was gonna say you know anybody who wants to show the film like just reach out to me okay. uh, anybody who wants to see it you know there, that was part of it too is like I, I i funded it in a way where i didn't have to go into debt or have a bottom line to make mm -hmm. up um, and even within that too um, as a result of the the money that i've been able to raise i was able to so far, I've actually donated two grand of it already to Lemuel and awesome. might be able to donate another couple grand um, nice. just from the Kickstarter, which was the goal, you know. But again, yeah, like for me, there's zero. I'm making zero money off of it. And as far as YouTube, the the link you sent over, I believe, is unlisted. Is yeah. it going to be something that you're going to have just open on YouTube so, or you think you're going to always keep it? Yeah. Uh, so so I was going to say, um, you know, maybe don't mention the link in the actual podcast, but yeah. Um, I'll, I'll just put, I was going to sort of say this, that, uh, like I said, my goal is not at all to make money off of it. I don't want to keep it behind like a paywall. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, you know, I would love for it to generate some level of revenue for the organization. And so I'm always trying to play this sort of like, where mm -hmm. do I go with it and, and mm -hmm. what do I do? But I, what I will say is anybody who's listening to this, any friends that you have, whatever, who wants to watch the film, 
Go to HaitiDocumentary.com. Go to the contact form. Say, I want to watch the film. I'll send it to you for free. Gotcha. Like, it's awesome. totally fine. It's not a public link. It's not something I'm sharing broadly at this point. But I, do, I don't want to keep anybody for, who's interested in. And, and even there, there's a, a sense of like ownership of like, you're seeking me out to see this. Yeah. You're going to have a better experience with the film because you're desiring to participate in it rather than if I just post it online. Whoever watches it, watches it. You can put it on in the background kind of a thing. Totally. You know, I desire people to engage with it in more of that kind of way. And so, you know, I, I'm not going to turn anybody down who's like, can I see the film? Yeah. And then if you are interested in showing it to a larger group, we might need to have a little bit more of a conversation just to have a sense for that. Um, but I'm not opposed to that either. I don't, I made it. So I'm like, I own yeah. the rights. I don't, I, there's not copyright law with it, but obviously I'd like to make sure that it, it's, I mean, a lot of it again is the, it's not so much about me. It's about representing the organization. Exactly. Well. Yeah. And What's been the feedback from Lemuel on it? Um, they they love it. Um, they were actually a decent part of uh, the production, so they saw multiple versions of it. And I made sure you know not not a line is out of place as far as what they want represented. Judy actually did a lot of work on the translations for the Crail, um, and so you know made sure that it was going through all of those things as well. Um, and I think I think it's being it's already doing what we wanted it to do in the sense of. Um, part of why I made it was part of it is it's a great story and I think it needs to yeah. be told. But yeah. part of it is it's very difficult for Lemuel to explain in a helpful mm -hmm. way, in a concise way, what is they do and why. And then even more than that, you know, there will be conversations sometimes about, oh, it'd be great if Manis could come and talk to, you know, like uh, come and talk on the Zoom call or, or do an interview with this or whatever. And it's like, no, it wouldn't be great because he's trying to help his community. Yeah, like, yeah. And so being really sensitive, like I've wanted to be really sensitive about not pulling a lot of resources from them mm -hmm. with regards to just, you know, getting permission to do this or, to, you know, asking them to do that. And so just, you know, we have developed that relationship where um, I think they, they very much trust me to do the right thing with, with the film. But that was part of the goal with the film is like, hey, guess what? You don't have to be anywhere. You don't even have to know that this is taking place. There's a 90 minute conversation that you can just automatically have with someone without even being there. Mm. There's, you know, you, they, they can sit down, they can watch it. They can have tons of their questions answered. They can spend time on the plateau in the community and it doesn't pull any resources away from Lemuel and that was very much my hope with it is to be able to expose more and more people to the organization to get some more people uh, excited about it and and on board but in a way again that's sustainable that treats people with dignity that isn't pulling a bunch of resources from an already pretty thin you know they're already stretched pretty thin and so and the, and the pandemic has not done them any favors um and so yeah I bet what's it looking like down there for them um I so it's you know the the fortunate thing is that they are about six hours north of Port-au-Prince, uh, which is where most of the turmoil is located. Um, but the reality is is that everything comes through Port-au-Prince, and so mm -hmm. as far as getting access to resources, um, it's put a strain on on an already okay. difficult system. Yeah. And then you know any time that they need to go pick something up, they have to send a staff member into Port-au-Prince, and it, and it, there's just an insanely high percentage likelihood that they're going to be kidnapped or harassed by <laughs> local gangs and so forth. And they've had staff members be um, kidnapped, I believe, and, and fortunately released unharmed. But it, it's just, it's, wow, it's bad yeah. even by sort of the standards that they're used to living in that context. And so, so they're, you know, the community themselves, they're innovating as always, you know, finding different ways uh, to, to navigate through the, pandemic um but yeah it's the resources are the big issue you know if 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 we're feeling the hurt of supply chain here they're feeling it right you know totally. yeah. old, so so what's next for nate shepherd uh yeah i was just thinking about that that uh <laughs> sort of you know i stepped into full-time media production about three years ago and i've been working on this film on and off you know for about four or five years so I don't really know what it looks like for me to have a career without this film hanging out over my head. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's a lot of me that's like, as, as the sort of pressure starts to dwindle on this particular project and I was finally able to get it out. And right now I think I have like two more things before I'm completely done with this project, which is wonderful. 
um, it's starting, my brain is already sort of filling in with probably way too much stuff. So yeah. I already have, I'm in conversation with another filmmaker um, to produce a, a documentary uh, about something that actually has a lot of overlap as far as just what is community. Um, I don't want to say too much about it, uh, so mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. But it, I think cool. that, that'll be a really special project. Um, I'm also a musician, as I said. I had composed the music for the film. That's an interesting thing, too. I don't know. I know. I want to go re-listen to it just for that. There is that one yeah. song, though, that was like the French. Um, I know when I was in Belize one time, they called it like, uh, gosh, what was the name? Punta music or something like that. Is that kind of like what it, that song yeah, that played um, a few times? Compas, I believe, Compas, would okay. be the, maybe the Haitian. I, I don't entirely know. I'm not, again, I'm not an expert on Haitian music. Um, but the so there is one song uh, that is, you know, in uh French Creole and is, you know, very much in the style of Haitian music. And that's actually uh, written and, and performed by Manis. Oh, really? Uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So he used to also be, uh, he, he did music. I mean, he's still a musician, um, but he has an, an album that he put together. You know, this was before he ever moved out to the, oh, wow. the area cool. he's working in now. So I felt like it was only appropriate to try. Yeah, to yeah totally. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but that's not my song. So. Yeah, uh, we're working on maybe finding a way to make that album available as well for people who are interested because there's oh, yeah, a bunch be of cool. other songs like that. Yeah, um, but nice. then the rest of the music uh, was mine. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I'm interested now in sort of putting more effort into music. It's always been something that I've, you know, it's my first love language. You know, I've been playing piano since I was six. And so mm -hmm. just really love, would love to be able to put some effort into that, maybe do something related to film and music we're still working on the details and I'm trying to not bite off more than I can chew because I've already done that. And yeah, I think that's, it's sort of this, if you know, that, that feeling of like, I can do anything when you push through something this difficult um, and get to the end of it and be like, I, I did it. And it, and it actually wasn't half bad. I can do anything. And it's like, yes, technically that's true. But also, uh, this puts a lot of strain on the family. It puts a lot of yeah. strain on me. Mm -hmm. It's like, but should you, you know, so I'm trying to be like, temper it and just you know this next season i'll probably try my best to not push too far into something but just play with a few different ideas and and put some effort i think i do want to i just need a break from it before coming back to this film and just saying okay how do i um I, you know how do i be faithful with it and just recognize that yeah i'm not looking for wide distribution yeah i'm not you know not all not all press is good press not all dollars are created equal. The film mm -hmm. even touches on that of like, yeah, I don't necessarily want this to go viral. That isn't necessarily going to help. Um, it might end up hurting more than helping. Yeah, um, I can see that. But I don't want to be stingy and I don't, you know, I recognize that this story is important and has a lot um, of good to do for the world. And so I don't want to. Yeah, be it's a great story. Yeah, Holding on to it, it tightly either. And so just trying to find that balance. And, you know, I've connected with my uh the college i graduated from and see if they've got something and there's a college locally that i'll i'll probably show it at and so try to find places to do it um and and just put it out there but like i said if if anybody's interested haitidocumentary.com is the place to go reach out and connect with me personally i'll try to keep it updated as yeah. well also you got the uh trailer right on the front page there too so yep. people that you know are intrigued by the story um and you want to watch the trailer to kind of get an idea even more visually of what, what the movie's about and Nate's work, definitely go HadyDocumentary.com, check it out and yeah, message him. Yeah. It's an, it's an easy URL to remember. I was surprised it was available. Was yeah. Like, right. Yeah. 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 It's hard to remember. Take it. <laughs> yeah. It's better than having tried pe people spell Le Manuel. They're like, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know. It's not. Yeah. That's, that was kind of my thinking is like, and ultimately, and I think of people walk away and they don't even really remember you know, Manise's name or Lemuel's name. Or City of God people. sticks with you, though. Yeah. The, so the title of the documentary is The City of God. Yeah. Uh, which, if you watch the film, you'll understand why yeah. it's called that. It takes you a while where you're like, I don't really know why this is called that. And then you yeah. get that scene and you're like, oh, that's why it's called that's that. That's why, yeah. Called. Yeah. So, but. Well, very awesome. cool, yeah. man. Yeah. yeah. Great job. I really, I thought it was an awesome documentary and you, you told the story well. And um, I know that you know, from how you put together, I'm sure the people let me well will be, you know, are grateful that you, mm -hmm. you've told their story. I'm proud. Yeah. 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 I think it's that that has been probably the, the biggest thing for me is just making sure that they they felt good about it. And I think they've been very 
very blessed and encouraged by it. And, you know, I sh I'll share feedback with them too. People will send me messages and stuff and I'll pass it on to them. And so um, I think it's been helpful for them to realize that that was part of the process too, is Manis originally was more like, you know, wanted to be, rightly so, wanted to be very focused on his community, but over time I think has understood the value of sharing these stories with other people to inspire them to to carry on that same mentality. And so, you know, very grateful to him for letting me follow him around with it. He's not a camera guy, you know, he doesn't like being on, <laughs> talking about it. With, Most you know, people don't, with his, right? Yeah. yeah. He wants to be with his people and, he, you know, speaking in a, a second language and trying to communicate. I mean, he's, he's a brilliant communicator, but grateful that he was willing to trust I mean the whole organization that they were willing to trust me this is a big deal to let cameras come in yeah and yeah do all of this and so I'm grateful that well thank you for sharing it with us man I mean yeah we really yeah. it's a great way to highlight you know people out there that are doing you know and making change in the world so you did a great job with that no oh, thank you I appreciate that and we'll just have to keep in touch too for the next project that's yeah. under wraps yeah. right now. I can't wait to, to get another call from me and just be like, all right, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> here comes the next one. <laughs> yeah, it'll be exciting. Uh, you know, trying trying to, to just sit with what has been done for now, but I'm sure eventually we'll we'll pick up on some new stuff. So cool. Well, thanks again for sharing your corner yeah, universe with us, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, so great. Mm -hmm.